my name is Isa Romanovska and I'm a senior postdoctoral researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Emma mentioned that uh, there are no, no best practice uh, guidelines currently in archaeology about how do we model those things. And, and I want to say this is a good thing, because if we all do the same thing, then we all get the same result, which will just then confirm to us that we're on the right path. We need different methods, different approaches, different elements in the models, and when we see that those different, very different models start converging, that's where we, are, we know we're onto something. So I would say this is good. And with that introduction, uh, my task here is not really to talk about my research. My task here is to say, what are the ontologies that we create for human dispersals? So by ontology, we mean what are the elements of the world, of the models that we most commonly use to, to develop models of dispersals. And I divided them into the drivers of dispersals and shapers of dispersals. Uh, I will explain that, but I just want to say that those differ vastly depending on the scale uh, of the simulation that, uh, that you're doing. So we will start with that. And in fact, I'll actually make it full screen. But you can see better. So this is as simple as any archaeological res uh, research. We have different scales of analysis. There are different research questions that interest us. Uh, individual migrations, regi regional diffusions, and global dispersals. You can use those names interchangeably. Individual migration, we will be looking at basically hu individual humans moving around, things like historical migrations, people moving from uh, Europe to US, Se seasonal shifts in, uh, in, the, in the foraging radius, uh, foraging as such. Uh, those are all where our agent, our, our main unit is one person. Uh, then we can go a little bit further and think about what if we're actually looking at households. We have those island colonization events, which are not just one person, it's, it's more than one. Um, things like the populations and, and population replacements when whole communities come in and come out. And then there, there may be uh, on a larger or smaller scale, but I, I'll just put them in, in, in this category. And then we have global dispersals, that, such as my favorite one out of Africa. Uh, such as uh, the spread of Neolithic, which is my least favorite one, or uh, the Paleo Indians uh, coming into Americas. And here we don't look at households. We literally look at the at the gigantic flow where you know one tick in my simulation, one one time step is like one thousand years, right? So we're not talking about households. We're talking about population species wide dispersals. And for each of those scales, there are different units, different little components that we use to build our dispersals. So, so let's start with drivers. The drivers of a dispersal is, you know, if you imagine this is a car, this will be the engine. What is causing people to go? What is the reason why they're moving forward? Um, and in uh, one of the most common way of doing it, especially for global dispersal, is just using population growth and push. And this is, the idea is basically that you have this amazing equation that we all use, and it's our favorite equation, it's called the logistic curve equation. And it basically shows how, when, uh, when, there's, uh, when there's a few people initially, they produce a little bit, they produce a few kids, but then as time goes, the, kid, the, the number of kids grows exponentially until you hit the carrying capacity and you just cannot have any more kids because there's not enough food. And then whenever this is used, it's usually used in models where there's a uniform spread in all directions because you're already modeling on such a scale that individual decisions kind of get, get washed up with, with, the rest, uh, with the rest of the, uh, of the equations of the things we do. So in those cases, you usually have the population and it spreads uniformly in all four directions. There is an interesting uh, example of doing it in a different way and it's uh, by Fulco. Fulcosherian, who instead of creating a push, he created pull. So as the agents, as his agents were dispersing, um, he had those kind of focal points that they might have a preference to go towards. And this is an interesting way that has been, as far as I know, used only once, and I think we should explore it further. Because the idea is that people disperse because they disperse. We're not modeling that. We know that it's probably population growth. But in which direction they will go, uh, which, which will be the, the things, uh, uh, that, that will you know, determine where they, that they're going is things like, oh, the rivers, or, um, or it's away from the origins, they just don't like their parents, right? Or they want to go along the coast. And uh, so this is a, a way of, of, of doing this, uh, of, of doing this uh, dispersal thing. And then uh, we've already seen this picture today. <laughs> 
And uh, very often what we are doing is not actually talking why people are dispersing, but just, uh, just that they are dispersing through. And then you just basically draw the lines of how would that be possible. I have to hurry up. I thought I was super quick. Shakers of migrations. When people are already going, what direction they're going to very often depends on the environment around them. Usually we use uh, for big dispersals biomes, so they prefer to go to, toward, through the environments they're used to. Uh, in, uh, for example, a sea dispersal, winds and currents are the currency of which direction they're going to go. There's also a lot of probability modeling. So basically, you go in all four directions, but you can do it by random walk. So you just randomly choose. You can do levy flies, which means you randomly choose, but uh, from time to time, you kind of go very, very far. Um, and there's always the question of what is an obstacle and what is the corridor? So depending on the type of dispersal, you can say, you know, a sea is an obstacle for the, for the hominins, not necessarily for uh, Polynesians, right? Or people in the Caribbean. Um, but those are usually environmental factors. And the one thing that we very rarely use in archaeology and, and address is what about other people? How, to what extent they are corridors <coughs> or, or barriers of dispersals? Um, this is something I, th I, think, I think that will kind of come crashing on us very, very soon. Uh, and I was asked to ask, talk about data. I will just quickly say we usually bring input data, which is environmental data and behavioral data, such as, yes, people make babies in a certain pattern. And the output is usually uh, arrival times at different locations. Probability of arrival as such, so by what time would you reach a given region, or can you even hit that Easter Island if you follow the currents, etc. cetera. And, uh, and there's a lot of also uh, individual outputs that are just not validated. So basically, you just come up with some abstract understanding of, of the process as such. And then you don't have output data. And that's it. <laughs>